Today's gospel begins rather dramatically. The man is running and kneels. He throws himself in front of Jesus. He's not the only one to do this, but uh, it's certainly always a, a rather dramatic moment in the gospel uh, when this happens. And he says to Jesus, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? It is the question that I think plagues all people across all times, across all spaces, right? Every society uh, is asking that question. It must be more than just this, and what happens after this? And can I ensure that I've got a good seat? And so Jesus then says, the, the, the man calls him good master, and Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Now, you could read this to say that Jesus is denying his goodness, but I don't think that that's what he's doing. I think Jesus is kind of affirming, actually, that he's been called good. In fact, another way to say this, then, is the man is calling him something more than human. And so then Jesus says, you know the commandments, and he lists six of the Ten Commandments. He leaves off, Jesus, the four commandments that are about God, but recites the six that, that are about neighbor. And that is a bit of a clue. So many times, I think, throughout history, uh, ministers have uh, put forward, and in particular in this country, very much that our salvation is something very personal. My personal Jesus. It's about my personal Lord and Savior. But Jesus, time and time again, says, you're no good if you aren't thinking about your neighbor. So this idea that we can be close to God without being close to our neighbor, I think Jesus right here is affirming it. Right? If we had recited the Ten Commandments at the beginning of the service, like we do at the 8 o'clock service, using the traditional right one, a service that we do every Sunday, we would hear the four commandments about God first. But Jesus skips right over those. And then he says, the, the man responds and says, I've been doing all of that since my youth which it's good that since he was like 12 that he hasn't been committing adultery or killing people, but it seems like a very kind of in some ways a very low standard, right? I mean, that seems like the least you should do is those things that are listed. And then Jesus, this great line, beholding him, loved him, and then says unto him, Jesus, this is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus has ever accounted for loving specifically an individual. Now, we all know in John's Gospel, for God so loved the world, right? But this is the only time in the Gospel in which the Gospel writer says that Jesus loved this person. Jesus loved him. And then Jesus challenges him. We cannot be challenged if we do not feel loved. It's basic parenting, right? If your children don't feel love, that you will stand by them no matter what, then you really can't challenge and form them. And it's the same with God. God wants us to know that He loves us first, loves us absolutely, loves us before we do anything, before we contribute anything. Jesus loves him and then challenges him to go and to sell what you have, to give it to the poor. And then he says, come, take up the cross and follow me. He's calling this man to something new, to be who God's called him to be. But in order to do that, later 
we hear Jesus talk about the gospel or the good news. And Mark defines this like a good writer in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 1. And the good news is to repent and believe. But repent isn't this remorseful beating yourselves on the back. Repent is a turning away from so that you can turn towards God. To turn away from all the things that distract you. So what Jesus is saying to this man is turn away from all the things that you put your value in and turn to me. And the man leaves grieved. He leaves sad. And it says, for he had great possessions. It begs the question is, what is Jesus' issue with wealth? We know that there were wealthy women who supported Jesus in his ministry. If they didn't have wealth, Jesus and his disciples would not have had a place to sleep, would have not had food to eat. So Jesus clearly hangs out with the wealthy, and he hangs out with the poor, but this man specifically, he has, shares this piece to him. So is the question for us is, is this really about money, or is it about something else? And the question, too, is, who is rich? How do we define someone of great possession? It then goes on, and the disciples uh, then, you know, a lot of times in the gospel, we just have a story of Jesus, and then, you know, we're left to interpret it 2,000 years later. But other times, the gospel writer takes a moment to share Jesus' interpretation of what just happened, or a conversation with the disciples. And that's what happens here. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Those who have a lot, he says, will have difficulty getting into the kingdom of God. It will be like a camel going through the eye of a needle. And his disciples, they say, are astonished. Now, why would they be astonished? The reason they're astonished is you may have heard about the prosperity gospel, right? If God has blessed you, if you follow what God has called you to follow, you will be rich in this life. And in fact, it's based off of this reading. And if you go uh, towards the end, right, Jesus even says, if you give up everything, you'll then get in this life a hundredfold. And it's based on that idea. But the prosperity gospel and that idea that people who have a lot, and a lot might be uh, if they have great material wealth, or they have a large number of children, or they have a lot of goats, that those folks have been blessed by God. And the reverse then is true, that those who don't have a lot, those who don't have a lot of material possessions, those women who have been unable to have children, those couples, they have been cursed by God. And this is an idea that predates the gospel that has pervaded cultures over and over and over again. It's as old as time. And the reason that the disciples can't get it is this man really being rich. Another way to look at it is how can this man who's been so blessed by God or other cultures at that time would have said the gods then can't even get eternal life. What's the hope for the rest of us? Who then can be saved? And Jesus answers in a way that the people at that time just cannot wrap their head around it because they are so used to salvation being dependent on them that when Jesus says, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. He's setting up what's going to happen in a post-Easter world. That God's love is for everyone. That God's salvation is for everyone. That whether you're rich or poor, no matter what your circumstances are, if you've been able to have a lot of children or none, 
You are blessed by God. And you have inherited the earth. So then Peter, still not getting it, says, we've given up everything, God. I mean, you can just imagine, like, Peter's throwing his hands up. He's, he's really frustrated by this. We know that Peter had a wife because we know that he has a mother-in-law. And we know her house in Capernaum. It's one of the few places that we're pretty sure of. And so Peter gives up family. He's traveling around after Jesus. He's given up his livelihood of being a fisherman. And so he's looking at Jesus, and he still doesn't get it. And Jesus says that those who give up for me, for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will receive a hundredfold now and in the world to come. You know what's interesting at the beginning of the story with the, the man is that he is called in a very similar way that the other apostles are called. The other apostles are called by saying, come, take up your cross, and follow me. And as I studied this, I couldn't help, there's no proof of this, but I couldn't help in hearing that. Just wonder, here's a man who Jesus loved, and Jesus says, lay down what you have to follow me, to be who God has called you to be. Was this man supposed to be the 13th apostle? What was supposed to be the story of his life? that he couldn't turn towards that and instead held on to the things that he held on to for the value of his life. The irony in this is that Peter doesn't understand. He goes, shouldn't that man of all men be able to get into the kingdom of heaven? But why did I give up all of this? And yet whose name do we remember 2,000 years later? Who have some of us named our children after? or grandchildren. We don't know the man's name at the beginning of the story, but we do know the poor fisherman's name. We know his name. We know Paul's name. We know Mary Magdalene's name. We know their names because we are their sons and daughters. They received a hundredfold. In Capernaum, there's a beautiful bronze statue that, of course, is an artistic rendition, but nevertheless, it's to remind us that this is Peter's hometown. There's no bronze statue reminding us of the man at the beginning of the story. Jesus gives up his life. He does the ultimate sacrifice. He turns from his divinity accepts humanity to turn towards us and is asking us to then turn towards Him. We don't have to ask the question that is asked at the beginning of this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because we know the answer to this question. We know it because of Jesus that God offers that to all of humanity, to everyone. We know God loves everyone that God is here for all. So the question for us today is, how do we help spread that message of love and grace? The question for us is, are we putting God first in our lives? Are we putting our neighbors first in our lives? We give of our time and talents and also of our material wealth to support the ongoing work of God's love in the world. We should give out of thanksgiving. In the nonprofit world, the idea is, and it's a right idea, which is that you go to your donors and you say all the great things that you've done with their money, and then you say, and so please consider giving us that much or more next year. And it's a selling of what 
the purpose of the organization is to get you along board with that. I have worked for nonprofits. I believe in that approach. But we are not a nonprofit. We are the bride of Christ. The old offertory sentence is our reason for giving. All things come from thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. What the wealthy man didn't recognize was that all of his possessions, whether they were material possessions, whether he's blessed with a great big old family, whatever the things that blessed him in his life were, all of that comes from God's bounty. The Creator made the whole earth for us to share in. I remember when my kids were little that they would get money from me or grandparents and I would say, now you have to give 10% of that on Sunday. And they'd throw their hands up in protest. That's my money. I said, you got it for free from me and your grandparents. But it's my money. I have things I want to do with that money. And I said, right, but first as Christians, we are called to thank God for the things that we receive. We give God the first fruits, not the last fruits. Because we recognize that ultimately, while that money came from me or from your grandparents or from whomever, that ultimately it comes from God. And we can laugh at children about it, but I think if we stop, we realize we can be that way. We should be generous from the bounty that we have, from whatever wealth we have, whether it's uh, material, whether it's your time, whether it's your talents. My grandfather and step-grandmother lived in a very modest home they built in the suburbs. It was three bedrooms, two baths somehow, less than 1,500 square feet. They went to work every day. But at Thanksgiving and Christmas, there was more than enough food because my uncle, who was gay, we never knew if there would be two or 10 or 12 people who would show up at the family get-together. We were all crowded in that house, all the aunts and uncles and the many cousins and also whoever else had been rejected by their family was welcomed by Margaret and AJ. And there was just, I didn't even realize this was what was going on when I was a kid. I just thought people liked to come for my grandmother's cooking. <laughs> you see, they didn't have a lot of material wealth, but they were blessed with skill. My grandmother was a very good cook. They were blessed with family that they could share with others. Our affirmation of the post-Easter understanding of God is that we say, because of your love, God, we give back to the church so that the church can serve the world in the name of that love. Christians actually cross denominations, right? We disagree about many things. There is one thing that we all affirm across denominations, including the Episcopal Church, which is that the biblical standard for giving to the church is the tithe, as set forth in the Old Testament. It's 10%. It has been affirmed by the Episcopal Church about once a decade, and in the last decade we reaffirmed that as the biblical teaching. And across denominations, this is held as the biblical teaching. In the Old Testament, you gave 10% to the temple. And then you were to leave grain in your field. You didn't harvest every bit of it so that the poor could come in and glean from your fields. So you gave to the temple, and then, as we would say now, then on top of that, you gave to the nonprofit. Now, I say that knowing that we all struggle to achieve that standard. And as you've heard already from me since April in the pulpit and even before that, that a God is a God of grace. 
So on the back of the pledge card, I want you to look and see where your income falls out and see where your giving has. And if it's at 1% or 2%, don't beat yourself up about it. Do not. No good comes of shaming ourselves. But maybe see if next year you can go from 2% to 3%. And set a goal that each year you'll work towards that tithe. Now, for some of us, we have extra time on our hands, and we could be giving that time. We have talents that we could be sharing. However you look at this, the point is, don't do what the disciples and the man at the beginning of the story did, and measure yourself by the world standard. But instead, look at God's standard for you. If you're a really busy family, and you're raising those kids, and you're getting them off to X, Y, and Z, and only twice a year can you get out there and feed the homeless, don't be shamed and look at it from the way that the world looks at it. Ask yourself, how does God see that? And I can tell you that I think that God sees that as generous. So for each of us, for each of us, it's a personal reflection. So take time over the next couple of weeks. Think about the order of your lives. Think where God is calling you. And begin to walk in that direction. Amen. Amen.